start our talk with uh, Chinab and Iksan. Uh, Chinab is the co-founder of Jubilee, which is a startup which empowers event organizers to intelligently match people and content at B2B events. Uh, you guys have a booth outside, I Yes, we do. Well. Yep. So, yeah, go and see them at their booth. Um, so apart from leading the development team, Jinab works on Moonshot Ideas that pushes the boundaries of interfacing recommendations technology with face-to-face -face interactions. Um, so Iksan is his uh, colleague at Julia, Jubilia. He's a software engineer. Iksan loves Python because of its readability and vast community. Uh, so to him, Python is close to the silver bullet. He's been studying Python for four years, and after four years of using the language, always makes him hesitant to say that Python can't do this, which I think we can all agree about. So let's give them a warm round of applause. Thank you, Josh. Good morning. My name is Chinab, and I'm here to talk about our presentation from Jubia. And it's great to be back again this year as a speaker with my awesome colleague, Iksan. So we're from Jubia, the one of the sponsors of this event, and being part and giving back to the tech community reinforces what I love while validating why we do what we do. And of course, we love Python. Python is the fuel for Jubilee. It's used in multiple applications, especially our recommendations technology and data analytics dashboard. We love it because it gives us high performance, easy to use data structures, and open source libraries for common processing. So a quick introduction to Jubilee. We make attending business conferences and B2B exhibitions worth your time by helping you arrange one-to-one -one meetings. We do this by intelligently matching people and content at events. So what brings us here today? We will be speaking about a scalable blueprint for product customization. To better understand what I mean by that, you need to picture a SaaS or software as a service business. At the heart of Jubilee, we are a SaaS technology. And by SaaS, I mean we're creating replicable products for our clients, like how Google Apps or Salesforce works. One easy way to describe SaaS is through the example of coffee. So if, if you have been in Singapore for a while, you would go to a local Kopitiam to get your copy. And the copy maker will have the same process when he makes a copy for you or when he makes a copy for me. So a quick show of hands, who here likes to drink the local copy? Okay, what, what type of coffee do you like? Coffee C. Coffee C? And you? Coffee Siu Thai. Okay, these are all different flavors of coffee and all of them are shown here. My personal favorite is Coffee C Siu Thai. So, there is a process for making all of these, and what we call this in a SaaS business is called configurations because it's just a difference in ingredients, but you're making the same end product. So copy O is configuration A. Copy O, just reduce the amount of sugar, is another configuration. But what if one of the coffee drinkers comes and asks for a special copy? The base ingredients are the same, but the difference is in the flavoring or maybe the process in making the copy. This is what we call the customization equivalent in a SaaS business. So if you guys come from a B2B company, you would understand when your clients request for such of these special copies. Only a handful of clients are requesting for such customizations. Sometimes you want to serve them this special copy because it helps increase your sales revenues, or it could be because you're dealing with enterprise clients who are always coming in with demanding requirements. So today, we'll be sharing about how to handle customizations in our current product, followed by the why and how of migrating to Python, and then we'll show you how easy it is to do these customizations through a simple coding example. And finally, what are the lessons we have learned? We have taken on this project for about nine months, so you guys will get a digest format of the takeaways in five minutes. So you need to take away two things from this presentation. The very first thing is the ease of handling product customizations for your own business. And the second thing is, 
if you have these obsolete codes lying around in your system, which I'm sure you guys have, how do you get started with the migration? So I hope everyone's ready. We're just gonna jump straight into it because I know everyone's had their breakfast. I'm not gonna wait for anything. This is our current architecture. So yes, it's the dreadful PHP, which we're using. Um, so the way it works is every project, in this case events in our, in our business, is an isolated set of code of front end and back end. And that's great because each project is isolated. That means you can do customizations easily without affecting another project. So if say, for example, project four was customized, it won't affect the other five projects shown. And the other thing is it supports dynamic routing, which is basically by default PHP with the LAMP stack has a directory based URL for each app name. And this allows us to access every project with the root and then the URL here. So this project, over here will be accessed at slash project one. This project will be accessed at slash project five. Pretty straightforward. Now, what are the pros and cons of such a system? So we'll go through the benefits first. The first benefit we feel is that the code can be easily replicated. You push your code from your repo to your master branch. Uh, once it passes your test and everything is good, it will create a copy of this code for your next project. The next is customized events can be handled very easily because every project is isolated. If you want to make changes in one of the projects, it won't affect the other projects. LAMP development is very fast, no doubt, and you have the quickest go to market, I would say. And finally, uh, while working with PHP, uh, you, since it's an interpreted language, you don't have to restart your server because it's so tightly integrated with Apache, which is great. Because uh, some of the current requests which are being served may be lost by our users. And PHP is high, highly tolerant for syntax errors. Uh, unlike Python where you, introduce a where you introduce a syntax error and then the app stops, whereas in PHP it's isolated to a single file. <coughs> but of course, no system is perfect and we realize that we need to move out from this because of certain reasons, which I will be sharing next. So the problems, the very first problem is majority of our code base in our company is Python and only a little of PHP. So we wanted to standardize this so we can make API calls internally much more easily. The next is the Git style is not so consistent because your core projects, you could always uh, take the code from your master branch and your customized will be feature branches, but these feature branches are never merged back to develop. And this creates a lot of silos inside the repo. The next is security. Personally, I prefer how uh, MVC like Flask handles security versus PHP. And if you don't just like the built-in security offered by PHP, you could always add in more packages like we use Talisman, which is an HTTP security header package for Flask. Next, bug fixing is a nightmare here because if you find one bug in one project, you have to go and fix those bugs in all projects manually. And finally, PHP. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we love Python because it's clean, it's compact, and it's predictable. <laughs> so with that, I would like to give the time to Iksan who would come up and find some solutions to the problems that she have addressed. Wait a second, two second, three second, four second, okay. Hello, good, okay. Okay, uh, Chinap has handed me the, uh, Chinap has handed the problem to me. Now what was previously his problem, now becomes my problems. <laughs> so uh, for to implement customization in Python, in Flash, uh, we have of a few idea of structure design in mind. <coughs> First, we have this one big flash up. Okay, imagine this flowchart is 
uh, one of our function, one of our view functions. So we need to implement if check in each for for each customized event. If this is event A, then uh, do this step steps for event A. And if this is uh, event event B, do the steps for event B. So finally. We see that uh, there will be a lot of if else in one of our view functions, and uh, Python did not like that, so we decided not to use this idea. Next, next, our idea is to build uh, to deploy uh, one flash instance for each customized app that we build. Firstly, we thought that this will solve our problem because it will create isolation, but the but then comes the problem that uh, this 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 structure uh, takes a lot of memory because even if the flash up even if the flash application is idle it's still taking uh, a few amounts of memory so the memory is used but no no user requesting the event no user requesting the app so this is a completely wasted memory then the third solution is to use uh, application dispatchers middleware, which is uh, <coughs> sorry. The, by using this uh, this feature from Workazook, we we can cut off the amount of memory usage, but we still get the isolation and we still get the customization scenario that we want. And this is our final structure of. Uh, the application dispatcher implementation. The user will request. The user request will be served by Nginx, and then from the Nginx will be received by application dispatcher. The app, application dispatcher then will decide which app that will serve the request. Now this is the full three directory structure of uh, our application dispatcher. This is our final structure. The app directory store our core application. This is all of our modules store and for uncustomized event, for uncustomized app, uh, it will be imported from here. We also put our index.html template inside our uh, static file. Okay. And this custom directory will, will store all of the custom event. So as you can see this in custom underscore if that only in the configuration and in the, the initialization is copied, not the whole blueprints not the whole code as uh, PHP before. Okay, so let's talk about the application detail, application dispatcher uh, and more details. Our user access our application by using this URL, uh, domain.com slash projects, slash this, this projects is the, <laughs> this project, this is the event name yeah. The, this is the event name. This is the, the the parameter that we that will be used to to define which uh, which application that will be serving the request. Okay, and uh, okay. The the request will be received by the WGS uh, WSGI modules, and then from the application dispatcher inside this module it will define which application is serving the request the to define does the event is custom or not we we check it by does this event name is exist inside the custom directory if it exists then serve the application inside the directory to to serve the request if it's not then use the core app to serve the request And this is the application dispatcher. We are using a URL path-based 
application dispatcher. This pet dispatcher is directly copy from flash documentation in application dispatching uh, section. You can check that and we just modify a little bit to make it suitable with our needs. This get event for prefix function is to I can see it. Okay, this this function is to check does uh, the event name from the URL uh, exists inside directory of customs. So if inside this customs directory is the same way the URL that uh, deploy the app from customs to to serve the request. And then which one? Oh, okay. And this is the function deploy app is to to deploy the applications. This is how do we uh, this is how we call in our WSGI modules. This applications is called by using we are using G Unicorn. This is the structure of our core apps. All of our blueprints module are stored inside this modules directory. Could you a little bit see, please? Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we only display just a little bit because uh, it would be too big to display all. Of them. Oops. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and this is we store our static files, and we only have one index. We only have one template. The test and other utilities. Okay, this is our Flash apps factory. We we define the config module inside as the as, as a parameter for apps directory because it's to simplifying when call uh, when doing testing okay and then we define the template folder as static here we ask uh, oh yeah this is the configuration to import from python modules then as usual and the this is the important part because App Factory will return a, a flash object, and we need to use this flash object in 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 the application dispatcher, not the function. So, from application dispatcher, we call this app uh, global app this app variable. Okay. Next. Now, this is our customization. First. In the dark edge of PHP, we copy 100% of our code. But using this application dispatcher, we only copy the initialization, only the init module and uh, configuration only. Even our configuration is importing from our uh, core app. We use star import because sometimes uh, we need to customize with a different configuration but just one or two line different configurations and then we commit this conf this customization into our repository and from for a blueprint that is not customized we just directly import it from our core app so it's reducing the amount of duplicated code oh sorry <laughs> this is the structure of the customized uh, application uh, we are handling event here so this is only the con uh, the the basic customization only require config dot py module and init dot py module but if we copy just like this then it would be the same as the core app there is no customizations but still it will be but still the the apps that serving the request is this app not the core app the customizations happen only when we do the customization scenario this is the apps factory for the customized event for the custom app 
See, we, we import the blueprint modules, the blueprint, and all of other required module from the core app. That's why we only require the configurations and the initializations. Yeah. After, after doing customizations, uh, we deploy our uh, apps using GitLab. So, uh, well, previously we just use uh, we, we we just use what's it called? FileZilla. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Classic, right? We use FileZilla to deploy uh, our code into uh, the server. But now we use GitLab because comparing to GitHub, uh, GitLab, I th uh, we think is simple enough. We don't need uh, a third-party service to deployment. Like GitHub that does not support deployment for now. And we are using rsync to send our code from from GitLab into our server. We like rsync because it only sends uh, it only push the file that is changed. So for the file that is not changed, it's not uh, not not sent to server. And this is the GitLab CI.yml. Uh, part of it. Uh, yep, this is the deploy stage. We don't need to write the password. And as you can see, this uh, using using GitLab. Uh, yes, sorry, using rsync, we can define uh, which uh, directory or file that we want to exclude from the server. So it makes our uh, our production server cleaner. There is no uh, no junk file or no uh, unnecessary file if we want to. Even if you really want to be more strictly, you you can exclude the GS file and but only send the mini file, static file. Uh, okay, uh, as Jinap uh, mentioned before, that the good things about PHP is when the when the syntax is error, when there is some include file that is not exist in in the file systems uh, the PHP process will keep running right the the the, the, the server the, the service will keep running it it's it's not working but the service will keep running and we try to implement that we we try to how to do that in Python but eventually we we cannot do that we, we didn't achieve that so uh, instead of uh, searching around and around we just decided that let's use use uh, let's just strengthen our test so instead of uh, letting the, uh, instead of um, ignoring the syntax error that was pushed to server so why don't we just uh, strengthen our test to catch the error in our development in our testing right as what the doctor says, uh, prevention is better than cure. Yep. We still using GitLab for our continuous integration for our testing, and wait, this is our real password. No. Okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, this is the this is our test stage just as simple as uh, running pytest we put the pytest configuration in our tox.eni uh, files okay uh, all of the theory is done i think this is time to show how we customize how we do our customizations yes okay okay so it's time to get our hands dirty just give us five seconds to set this up four done three okay <laughs> should i get that okay oh we might need to do you wanna okay okay Okay, Iksan, so could you first show us how our core application looks like? 
So this, imagine yourself, you're an attendee at an event. It could be PyCon, it could be another big trade show. You'll be getting an invitation to this platform, which is a closed system for only the people going. And you can see everyone else who is going at the event. And you can see in this case, there are a few options you could do, like search and some more other options. So let's just jump directly into request received. Okay. Okay, looks like Iksan over here has received a request from someone. This is Miguel. So let's click on Miguel's card to see more about Miguel. And looks like over here, Iksan, it says something, hello, Mr. Gajari. Is your name Mr. Gajari? Right now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes. Imagine this is our core app, but one of the client comes in and asks for a simple customization. I want to change something in the message part, right? And this is pr primarily backend driven. So we'll now jump inside the code and we will make the changes to this message part of the app. So next up, we'll just go inside our server. Let me scroll. Okay, so we're going to SSH directly into our dev server. Of course, you're supposed to be coding locally, but we're going to avoid that part because GitLab takes a long time to run the tests. So right now we have SSH'd in. The first step is we're going to be copying the custom template for the demo app, which requires the customization. Just note that when you're doing that, in our, like in our use case, the name of the folder must be the same as the name of the application itself. Okay, inside the So you, you can copy the custom template. Okay, so once that's done, we're going to enter inside the app factory. Okay, and then we're going to remove the refer reference from the core app. So in this case, uh, the part which was customized was the request module. So we're going to remove that part, and we're going to add the customs part. Oh, it looks like looks like it's already added. Yes. I demo. <laughs> okay. Let's just let, let's just delete this. Yeah, let's delete and redo that. We show the the core first. Yeah. The web. Okay. And oh. Do Let's continue from here. So we're gonna redo the step of copying the core, the custom template again. Okay. And once that's done, we're gonna go inside the app factory. Yes, this looks good now. So yes, the customization is regarding the message part. And the message part is being served by the profile module, core reference. OK, and once that's done, we're going to include the customized module, which is like a blueprint. 
So we have included the customized module, but we don't have any blueprint yet, so we have to go set that up. So let's go right after this step. We're going to be preparing our customized blueprint, which is a profile module. So to do that, we start by copying the blueprint over from the core, because it's essentially the same thing. We simply have to make one amendment. Okay, and once that is done, we're going to enter inside the customized module and edit the view function of the endpoint which was changed. So what we have to do is we have to reference the core uh, for the rest and custom for the profile module. In this case, the, the endpoint which is changed is the tweet pitch. So we're going to change that reference to the custom folder. And if you guys notice, none of the other endpoints have changed, so we're not going to be touching them at all. Okay, so our blueprint has been set up now. The next thing is to actually put in the tweet pitch file which we are referencing. So again, the tweet pitch file should be copied over from the core module because we're making a small change from the common one. Alternatively, you can write your own tweet pitch file in this case. The tweet pitch is already copied. That's already copied? Yep. Okay, so we'll enter inside the tweet pitch file we will jump to the place where we need to make the change in the message. So this tweet bits is the view function. So this, this is the part which is rendering what you guys saw inside the web-based application. And we're going to make a very small change. Let's maybe just put a string in with the message. All right, okay, so we'll save this and at this point you should be coding locally and then you'll push your code, it'll go through the CI, it'll run the test cases, the CD, but for now we're coding directly in the dev server, so we're just going to restart the server for our codes to take effect. Yep, and we'll jump back to the web application to see the changes. So we have to restart, uh, refresh, right? I think so. Oh, well, we don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so it works. So it's a very simple thing. I'm just going to recap what we've done here. Uh, we have a core set of code and we have a template. We first start by copying the template over. The template is just bare bones. It just has an init file and a config file. We copy that. We copy it with the same name as the project name. In this case, the project name. So we copy it with the name demo. We copy the blueprint in from the core. We change the init file. To then after that, we will go and make the changes to the, the custom file itself to achieve the customization. So it's, this is great because one, you have not affected your core code at all. It's in a separate folder directory and uh, it's running on the same instance. So as a company, we run like 50 events a month, which of them, maybe five to 10 of them are customized. Uh, the good thing is we can still achieve customization with minimal memory impact. We don't have to be spinning up more servers for all our customizations. And that's why we chose this kind of design. Okay, so I'm just going to jump back to the presentation. Oh, 
That is the presentation. Yep, very nice. Okay, so we have shown you how the core app works, how we customize, and how we deploy. The deploy part has been skipped. Okay, finally, we're towards the end of the presentation, so we're going to talk you guys through the lessons which we have accumulated over this time. So, when I started giving this presentation, I told you guys there's two things you guys have to take away. One is how to get started with a migration of an old code, and second, in customizations. You'll start with the migration. When, when you're starting a migration, it may seem like a lot of work, but you've got to break it down into two parts, the design and the implementation. The design is where you will try to solve the high-level problems of your architecture, and implementation is the coding. The second thing is the design stage is often overlooked, and it's very important because it's the framework for your whole application moving forward. The implementation, on the other hand, is simply code translation, which is the easy part. And finally, it's important that you guys communicate to your business unit, I'm assuming all of us are programmers over here, that we need a feature freeze, or else you'll be developing in two architectures always, and you'll have a never-ending race condition. The next is about product customization. So for your B2B business to grow, I believe that companies, be it small or big, should be taking up customizations. But it's a very slippery slope because once you take up one customization, you'll start taking up more customizations. And that, therefore, you need to have a good design in place to handle those customizations. So very first recommendation is to choose a customization design which works for you. We, lo we love the application dispatcher. It's out of the box. Uh, it's running multiple, it's sort of running multiple Flask instances on a single interpreter. And that's good because none of them are alive if no one is requesting them. So its memory footprint is much lower. But in the case, if you have fewer clients with uh, maybe bigger deal values, you could even spin up new instances running a separate uh, WSGI instance on them. That also works. So you have to choose something which works for your business. You got to evaluate customizations and not simply take up any of them just because you have now a solution for it. Because the customization should either be bringing business value, it could be in terms of number of deals or the amount of deals, or it could be bringing product value. Like you do a customization for one client and this feature could be implemented for other clients as well. And finally, you always have to take care of code scalability. So I know when companies start up, like for us as well, we started on a simple MVP, and now we're moving out, and we have to really consider about code maintenance, bug fixing easily, CI and CD. Yep. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, thanks very much, Beth. We, we have time for one or two questions, if there are any, any hands. One over there. Separate events live in different repos, or is it still one repo? In our current design, they all live in the same repo.